Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled 116th Congress, the Federal Government's Healthcare Agenda. I'm Kate Cloud, Staff Attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenters, Michael Strazella and Edward Pilera, thank you for joining us. Michael Strazella is co-head of the Washington Office and Practice Leader, Federal Government Relations for Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Michael has deep experience in federal government relations, legislative strategy, grassroots advocacy, political action campaigns, and coalition building. He focuses his practice on the health industry, advising the pharmaceutical, hospital, and health system, health plan, and retail and compounding pharmacy industries. Adept at navigating relationships, Michael works closely with Congress and the executive branch, including the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the Food and Drug Administration within the Department of Health and Human Services, U.S. Customs, and the Drug Enforcement Administration to create effective lobbying strategies for the healthcare sector. Before joining Buchanan, he worked for a state hospital association where he was responsible for federal lobbying efforts, strategy, and oversight. He also managed congressional and regulatory affairs for several national physician associations that had interest in the laboratory and mental health space. In addition to his experience managing congressional, regulatory, and regional relations, Michael worked on several U.S. Senate and statewide campaigns. He holds a BA in political science from Gettys Gettysburg College. Edward Alera is co-chair of Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney's FDA group and counsels clients on new product development and business opportunities in the area of pharmaceuticals, high-tech products, medical devices, food, and cosmetics. Ed has devoted his entire career to healthcare, both as a pharmacist and as an attorney. He began his career at the Food and Drug Administration, where he served as Associate Chief Counsel. Because of his ability to integrate science and the law, Ed has become highly respected by clients in the pharma and biotech industry as the person to call in a make or break situation. He holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center and a BS in Pharmacy from West Virginia University. With that, I am pleased to turn things over to Michael. a catchier title for our presentation uh, today, but um, did want to uh, say thank you to Medmark on behalf of Ed Alera and I, and uh, let's get started. So um, as of November 2018, we have a very new Washington, D.C. congressional makeup. Uh, we had gone from Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican White House, and we can talk about uh, during the Q&A if people would like about some of those differences uh, that we have seen with that shift, but we've seen a shift in power and a shift in messaging and how Washington is working. With uh, the Senate, there was uh, a decrease uh, in Senate Republicans, but it's now a 53-45 uh, Republican Democratic shift. And as a result of that, no one party has 60 votes. And 60 votes is extremely important because what you uh, what is required to end debate and move to a vote on a bill is 60. So um, there's been talk about reducing that filibuster for certain appointments, uh, especially to the bench, but really on legislation it remains at 60. And that's extremely important because you do need some type of uh, cross-aisle agreement on how to proceed with a vote uh, to move forward with policy issues. So. Um, when you do that math, there's two independents caucus with Democrats. So it takes three Republicans, four Republicans really, to shift on an issue to create chaos. In the House, we have 235 Democrats, 197 Republicans, and then three vacancies. Um, a member from Pennsylvania resigned after he was sworn in uh, to go into the private sector. A member resigned, and we're still waiting on some, on some certification in North Carolina, and that's where the member who passed away is. Uh, so those will be special elections, and we'll have to wait to see how that works out. I would anticipate that uh, all three wind up in the Republican column. So we could see at the end 235 Democrats, 200 uh, Republicans, and the magic number there in the House is 218 majority is needed to move legislation. Um, when you look between Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy, there is not a whole lot of love between the two. There is not, um, that is really where you will see the Democratic Party moving their agenda, 
without consultation from the Republicans uh, and the Republican leadership. In the Senate, there is a lot more discussion between uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. When you think of within healthcare as a lobbyist, and it is not a dirty word, even my mother now calls me a lobbyist uh, to show how far she has come. Uh, but when you look at this, we really focus on certain key committees uh, that are slated to set healthcare policy. Uh, those committees are appropriations that really drive the financial side of um, a lot of programs, a lot of federal programs, the Energy and Commerce Committee that has strong jurisdiction over Medicaid, but also pieces of Medicare. Judiciary Committee is something I traditionally haven't put in, uh, but um, I, I will come back to why I did. Oversight and Government Reform, and then Ways and Means, and I've highlighted those committee chairmen as well as the ranking member in red. Uh, when you think of the Energy and Commerce Committee, they did the 21st Century Cures. When you, uh, Chairman Frank Pallone, ranking member Greg Walden, they work really well together. Uh, and they have come together on major pieces of legislation. 21st century cures, mental health legislation that was actually rolled into the 21st century cures. So they work well together. But I think we need to remember that always first and foremost, these people are party loyalists. So they will try and come together, but they're not gonna cross their parties uh, too much to do that. Uh, when you look at the Judiciary Committee, the reason why I put that on there is because a major part of the discussion and how, how we can lower drug pricing has been around patents and patent exclusivity. So that's going to fall underneath the Judiciary Committee. So they've started to examine that. That's been a conversation. When they get there, we'll have to determine um, at what point in their, the congressional agenda. It's not going to be immediate, but it is something that they're going to explore. Elijah Cummings, he's the one that started the entire drug uh, pricing examination and investigations. They do have that oversight. They have done where they brought in Valiant, Turing. Uh, before that, he sent a letter to 17 branded and generic companies uh, asking them for information around their pricing strategies. And what a lot of people may not know is how this all started. Why did Elijah Cummings from Maryland, the Baltimore area, get so involved? And that was primarily because he had had lunch with the CEO of Johns Hopkins, at least this is what has been told to me by his staff. Uh, he had lunch with the CEO of Johns Hopkins University Hospital, and the CEO was complaining about a heart drug that was costing them their drug spend, that, that increased their drug spend exponentially, and he was very frustrated. So Elijah Cummings got involved, and as he did, he started to peel back the onion and see that it was more systemic in their mind. Ways and Means is the tax committee. So with Medicare, because there's a Medicare tax and parts of your paycheck go to fund the Medicare program, they have jurisdiction over Part D, Medicare Advantage, and there's been a lot of discussion around um, how they're going to handle it. And, and when you think of overall Medicare, uh, any type of reimbursement, any type of service falls underneath their jurisdiction. When you think of the United States Senate, um, it's very similar. The Appropriations Committee uh, is very similar. The Finance Committee is very similar to the Ways and Means Committee on their jurisdiction. When you look at the Homeland Security and Government Affairs, this is actually very unique. It's not a committee that I would usually list, but again, at the end of last year, they examined some drug pricing and <coughs> the, um, some uh, companies around their pricing strategies. And because they uh, released that report, the thought is that they, they might do some hearings again this year and try and continue that, that effort. Judiciary Committee, again, the same reasons around patents. And then the Senate Committee on Aging, this is actually uh, a committee that uh, uses their, they are a special committee, but they use their jurisdiction um, regarding any type of drug that will wind up playing or any type of policy, whether it be Medicare, that they can have an examination without stepping on the toes of other committees. When you think of these committees, um, I will say Chuck Grassley uh, had been chair before. He's now retaken the helm. 
uh, with Senator Orrin Hatch retiring. He was a good friend to the drug companies um, in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, but he and Ron Wyden work very closely together. And uh, we will see a lot of the hearings going forward, the two working together. And that's where you'll see the most activity, as well as the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee between Senator Lamar Alexander and Senator Murray. Those two work well together. Uh, the Senate says they are the, high, the higher chamber, the upper chamber, and therefore you see a little bit more uh, party crossing within uh, agendas as well as how they work with each other. So overall, the 116th agenda, as I try and look at this, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and it's things shift as things come up, but really um, where we've been able to find the most um, unanimity around uh, what people talk about are around the Affordable Care Act, what is going to be a real issue that they talk about versus 2020 election spin. Uh, for nine years now, 10 years, this has been something that Republicans have been using. It's starting to, to fall to the wayside, but there are still pieces that people are able to energize the base in the Republican Party around. Healthcare IT and telemedicine, we've started to see this on the rise. Uh, the question will be how much can they, and we can talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. Drug pricing, obviously there's three different buckets I see this, where Congress is moving in, in a direction, you have the administration that's being very aggressive, and then the industry that's playing defense, and they're even somewhat turning on each other. Um, and when I say industry, I just don't mean pharmaceutical, I mean the purchasers, the PBMs, the health insurers, and again, we'll talk about that. And then hospitals. What are they going to be pushing for versus defensive issues that they're going to have to play to? Uh, the future of the ACA lawsuits, um, this is, or the future of the ACA, uh, there was a lawsuit uh, that was filed by 20 Republican state attorney generals in Texas. Uh, Texas judge found that the ACA was unconstitutional at the end of last year. You've had a big push around Democratic attorney generals that have actually um, appealed. The big piece here is this was seen, he threw out the entire law. And people would think that we've looked in the past, things have been seen before the state Supreme Court, whether it's been a certain tax, whether it's around certain provisions, but to throw the whole bill out under the premise that um, certain pieces are unconstitutional, therefore that undermines the entire bill, uh, really unravels this. And this is very dangerous because you are talking about over 20 million people now becoming uninsured if this is thrown out, and how would this move forward? What would it mean for Medicaid matching money that goes towards states that have moved people into those roles uh, from uninsured through the Medicaid program? And then, um, so we're gonna see this work its way through the higher court. How high it goes is unclear, but while all this is unraveling, uh, the, the law is, remains in effect during this appeal, which is extremely significant. This is just a visual to give you an idea of where those state attorney generals are. Um, and uh, so you can see a little bit around the geographic piece in this Midwest, people are not necessarily getting involved. It is not as much of an issue for them. So within Congress, that's the courts. But then when you think about Congress, what are they gonna be doing? What, is, what are they gonna be examining that they see as a priority to try and help critique um, going into 2020, a uh, presidential election, what is it that they need to handle? Uh, the Senate Health, Education, and Labor and Pensions Committee, they've talked about taking up stabilization um, rates within the insurers. That's something that they have pushed for, and I would imagine that they are going to, we are going to see some form of legislation and agreement around that. They were very close at the end of last year. They just quite honestly ran out of time. And then when you're looking at this year, because of the government shutdown, it really delayed a lot of action. And I would say it's really only been the past three weeks uh, that we've seen Congress really operating the way they usually do around hearings, legislation being introduced, and really the members of the Senate and the House talking about their agendas. I would expect something on pre-existing conditions. This is something that nobody wants to see get taken away. Uh, because it just does not play well politically, uh, and um, it would really undermine a lot of the healthcare uh, pieces of the ACA that have moved forward. 
I have listed here the bipartisan, I, can, I believe it's bipartisan, um, and I think that's more than just one person, but the repeal of the Cadillac tax and the medical device tax. Cadillac tax has been something that's been coming up quite frequently on um, certain type of insurance plans. Uh, I, I'm not sure we're gonna necessarily see a repeal of it. The medical device tax were in year two of its second two year delay. So uh, this has been something that has been um, the cost of it was really on the front end, so as time goes on, it's becoming less and less of a coster to the federal government. Uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar has been driving this in the Senate, and Senator Pat Toomey, a Republican from Pennsylvania, has picked up the Republican lead as the Republican uh, has, is no longer in the Senate uh, to do a permanent repeal. <clears throat> and to give you an idea, it's $10 billion over 10 years if they do that, and that means they have to find some cost savings. That means somebody else is gonna get dinged along that route within the overall program. Uh, and then the question, which I think the answer is gonna be no, uh, will the House see a vote on Medicare for all? And I didn't include it, but when you look at really the people who are not on the bill as co-sponsors, they are people who are in more competitively run races between Republican and Democrats. So they do not want to go that far to what's considered the left of this bill. And I think there's a lot of answers that are, that, or a lot of questions that are unanswered uh, around this bill right now. And it's a bit of a rallying cry for Democrats who are early uh, announcers for the uh, presidential candidacy. When um, you think of the health IT and telemedicine, it's something that has really been on the rise. Uh, this is something that I first worked on, telepathology, back in 1997. It's taken 22 years to get to this point. Uh, and um, part of the challenge here, so everybody has an understanding, is there's a lot of hidden savings. How, how do you quantify somebody not having to drive two hours and have their nephew drive them to that appointment two hours away? Um, and that now that nephew, that family member can drive 20 minutes, not have to take the day off. Um, so there's a lot of savings. And that person's not having to go two hours for full services. They might be able to stay locally and do um, some type of telehealth um, consult. And whether it's a check-in, making sure that they're adhering to their medication or being able to check their vitals uh, remotely is something that's <coughs> something that is very hard for the government to quantify, so as they move forward, they're not able to capture those savings. With that said, CMS really continued through regulation to try and expand on pilot projects and expanding reimbursements uh, for these services. So I would expect to see a continuation within the Medicare Advantage program, um, trying to really remove restrictions, especially in rural areas. That's where the original driver of this really started around those geographic and originating sites. And by originating sites, it means um, where the person is. Uh, there has been licensure issues around telemedicine in the past. States are working through that. We've started to see more and more states adopt telemedicine laws. And because of that, it's really been able to open up uh, a better pathway at the federal level. Uh, the other is gonna be how is nursing homes and senior care gonna be uh, impacted and how are, what kind of play are they gonna make? Um, and then you gotta switch over to the telecommunication side. All of this is gonna require stronger T1 lines, uh, especially in rural areas, uh, and better equipment. So we're gonna see uh, an expanded broadband. I would expect some type of, if they move this, some type of grant money for those areas. I know a lot of geographic areas are pushing for that. Uh, in the mental health space, telebehavioral health has definitely taken off with telepsychiatry. We've seen that uh, increase, especially when it's around psychotropic adherence, trying to do those check-ins. It's not necessarily a diagnosis, but it's really um, making sure that people are taking their medications. And then interoperability. Uh, there's been a lot of conferences that have been of late. Actually, there's one in Baltimore today uh, around uh, state uh, health information exchange. Uh, CMS just recently, less than a month ago, introduced a proposed rule, CMS actually did, around the proposed rule. The purpose of it is really to increase accessibility of patients to health information, and then how is that, and, and it, 
the jurisdiction that they utilized was providers, Medicaid, CHIP, Medicare Advantage, my slide is missing a comma, Medicare Advantage, and Medicare and Medicaid MCOs. Um, and Congress will also piggyback on that. This is something that Congress wants to examine um, and continue. And interoperability really started back in 2009 uh, with a lot of grant money to be able to push for this. Uh, hospitals have gotten on board, so we're starting to see this in um, some type of transformation. Uh, and there's issues around privacy issues with interoperability, but th those things are getting worked out little by little. As far as drug pricing in the administration, um, the administration at the end of last, or not the end of last year, a year, almost a year ago, came out with their blueprint for America of how to lower drug prices. This is something that President Trump campaigned very heavily on. He has been very true to his word. Uh, that's not a political um, bias in any way. It is something that we have seen him stay very focused on. Uh, whether it's been Rose Garden discussions, whether it's been appointing very um, high-level executives, uh, Secretary Azar, former Eli Lilly person. Uh, the person who came in to handle the drug pricing was Dan Best. Um, and Dan was very knowledgeable of these issues. Unfortunately, he, he suffered a very sudden um, death. Um, and John O'Brien, who was the number two, who actually has been at our firm, um, for some events that we've highlighted him for, is extremely knowledgeable and extremely communicative. And I will say the administration uh, has yet to take a meeting that we have asked for around this issue. They always want to hear from people, so uh, I would encourage you to reach out uh, and try and, and work through people to get those meetings. So they've actually started to roll out a lot of rules since then. But within this, they came up with really four buckets. Um, of how they wanted to drive down cost and they were going to put proposals in. And this wasn't just a blueprint. It was also a request for information. So they really were trying to involve the larger community uh, in recognizing that they wanted feedback of how to do this, recognizing that this is such a convoluted issue. Drug pricing, there is no one pressure point that you can alleviate that's going to fix this. I think of it as a balloon. If you squeeze in one area of a balloon, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of pop out on the other side. And it's really trying to find that balance of that entire balloon to try and drive this down. So they put these in four budgets, improved competition, better negotiation, incentives for lower list prices, lowering out-of-pocket costs. And then the other is that they started to talk about, um, and they came out with really approaches around lowering Part B prices, whether that's through negotiation, the International Pricing Index, since then, since last May, they've rolled out a proposed rule, and this will go forward where they will index 17 company, or 17 countries, excuse me, 17 countries of what their prices are, and they will index U.S. prices based off of that. Uh, and see, and that's a five-year demonstration project. And one of the things I've always learned is within demonstration projects, they're very easy. They do not require legislative uh, approval. You can do a pilot program, demonstration project program, and then once you have that data, it's easier for them to then move it into uh, final regulation. Uh, they've been, there's been a lot of talk around reimportation um, that's been considered not only by the FDA that's talked about it, but also some members of Congress. And then the anti-kickback regulation, uh, where they just recently came out with with a model that's going to really gut the PBM role within rebates. Uh, and to kind of go a little bit uh, more in depth on some of those, uh, when you talk about the lowering drug pricing um, and reducing out-of-pocket costs, the president divided into two categories, actions that he may be able to take directly, which we've started to see since then, which really is the lower half of um, this slide, and then the other is where he requested feedback. Uh, also around the competition negotiation, they started uh, January 1 to have step therapy for Part B drugs and Medicare Advantage. This is something that received pushback uh, primarily among oncologists uh, in that community because they do a lot of um, injectables, and that's where the step therapy first focused on within an office. He has put together a working group to examine drug importation. 
And then generic drug approvals, one of the things they've talked about is how they've really been able to increase the total number in July. And then there's been a lot of talk about how is it that you can try and focus around something called the CREATES Act, which allows generics to get access to lots um, to be able to compare what they're producing against us and what type of barriers. And we saw this just last week in a hearing uh, in Congress that talked about this and they were really focusing on how branded companies and their patent exclusivity has been, uh, has allowed them to not necessarily or to impede generics uh, ability to get these comparison lot, um, medications. Uh, the other is around transparency and uh, we've started to see this with um, CMS putting up list prices on their CMS drug dashboard. Uh, We've also seen that right now they're, um, as of today, I believe, OMB is in receipt and Office of Management and Budget, OMB, they actually have final review before they send it back. They're kind of the final copy editor of regulations and they actually now are in receipt of um, a rule that is meant to um, require uh, pharmaceutical companies to list their prices in any direct-to-consumer ads. So, so we've started to see that. Um, around out-of-pocket cost, um, they've, taught, they've done regulations around gag clauses for pharmacists, being able to allow them to talk to um, uh, patients when they come to the counter around your physician ordered this. You know if you got this generic, it would only cost you X. Uh, we've seen a lot around the 340B, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And then there's just a lot of talk around out-of-pocket cost and wanting to try and drive it down. Now, that's just the administration side. So when you think about Congress, they've been doing their issues, and they have to balance a little bit more. You know, they, have, they have office hours, so to speak, that are a little easier for people to come in and talk to them and express their, uh, whether they're disgruntled or whether they like issues. And drug pricing is one of the few places where I would say in this overall dynamic that we have seen some bipartisan interest. Now, how they get there is a completely different story. Um, there's been a lot of turf wars and finger pointing, and I've listed for you on the slide really who those folks are. Um, and it's incredible how quickly people turn on each other in D.C. Um, right now, what I would say is missing in all of this is the bad example, the scapegoat the, the Turing Pharmaceutical, Martin Sir Kelly, um, that's, that's people can rally behind and really shame. Um, I will say that PBMs, because they are somewhat faceless, you know, you don't go to a pharmacy, you're not necessarily paying a premium, uh, you're not um, getting the pill bottle that may have the drug company's name, but because of the middleman, it's a little easier for people to be pointing the finger at them in the rebate issues. Um, I will say during a lot of testimony, you hear pharmaceutical companies saying the 340B reimbursement and the increase in hospitals is one of the reasons why their, law, why their price, list prices have gone up. Um, and then we've seen the issue around misclassification under Medicaid by pharmaceutical companies. And then the question is how is it that uh, Congress is really focused around how is it that they can incentivize competition? Um, the next few slides, um, I really want to focus on the first and then the rest are kind of for visual. Um, but one of the things that we're starting to see is more data and they're getting more minutia in the data. So here's something that was put out by Politico Data Point um, that talks about the single manufacturers and how they are really the drivers around Medicare and Medicaid spending and how is it that um, they're going to be able to uh, drive that cost down um, and increase that competition. Uh, that's something that Republicans are starting to latch on to. This gives you an idea of that increase of cost just over four, a four-year period um, in those three areas that fall under Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I have to say I was very surprised by an almost 15% increase under Medicaid. Um, when you think of they've also started to look at um, in the Medicaid program, um, really what is the percentage for single manufacturers? So is this, issue, is this an issue around competition? And the data is showing that there's the lack of competition allows for increases. Uh, you also see that in the Medicare Part D program. And then you also um, 
sorry, you see it in the Medicare Part D program. Um, around the drug rebates, um, HHS came out with their anti-kickback statute around drug rebates. This obviously was a very big issue. Um, all sides, uh, the big pharma uh, came out in support of this. Uh, the generics were a little more silent on it uh, and did not necessarily get behind it. And then you also have, uh, obviously, the PBMs and the insurers who have a concern. And the reason for that is when you think of how a PBM works, um, it's, and, and this is attributable, um, I don't have the source on here, but it's attributable uh, to um, slide, well, this previous slide. Um, but when you think about this, they, right now, they take a list price, they negotiate based off of volume and usage with the insurer and with the, the pharmaceutical company to try and, and bring back uh, a rebate based on that volume. And then that, they take some of it themselves and then some of it they give to the insurer. Um, so right now, um, it's all based off of sales and it's being considered based on this rule as an anti-kickback that it's keeping certain people off the formulary, certain people on, and they're pushing just the drugs on the formulary. So, and, and you can see how this alters the flow of, of, the, pay, of the, um, the discount to the patient. The patient's not necessarily seeing a discount in this situation. So they're still paying their same copay. And one of the things that's really being driven by this is they wanna see that the, benefit, the PBMs take a cut um, when uh, uh, a less of a rebate or less of a financial um, incentive, and then how is it that they're going to pass this on to the patients? So this really has two ways that they try and do this um, uh, manufacturer payments, where they're saying, well, in one area, um, it is something that they can have set fixed fees, and it's not necessarily based off of what they've sold in the volume. Uh, and um, also, how they can offer discounts that go entirely to the consumer, directly to the consumer. One of the pushbacks that is occurring is that, one, PBMs, some, the numbers shift, but one of the common numbers that's been used is that PBMs are really receiving only 5% of that supply chain uh, revenue that's being discounted. Uh, and the insurers are saying, this is revenue to us. If we do not see that revenue, then that's going to still have to be made up. That's driving down overall premium cost. Without that type of revenue, premium costs are going to go up. And as many of you know, if you're following the healthcare industry, most of the major PBMs now are owned by pharmacies um, or insurers. Um, moving on to another issue that's um, been talked about is importation. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that 10% of medications are counterfeit. Um, there's people on both sides of this that think this is an easy way to drive down cost, bringing it in from Canada, it, and the questions around whether it's safe and effective. These aren't being manufactured in Canada. They're being made in overseas. It's a lot harder to track the entire life cycle of that medication from when it's manufactured to when it gets to the patient, even though it's coming through Canada. Um, and then who's going to guarantee that safety along that life cycle of that medication? Um, and I say, remember the MMA. And I don't know how many people remember um, back in the early 2000s where the MMA that created Part D, there was a study around this, uh, and the study did not come back in a positive light for importation. Some uh, issues around um, hospitals and what they're dealing with, surprise medical bills and balance billing. Um, when a patient winds up in an ER or within a hospital and, and necessarily, they may think that the hospital is within network, it may not be, or the physician may not be necessarily a part of the network, but still has hospital privileges, they're getting a very large bill. And how is it that they can handle that? Um, same with executive compensation. I, I had mentioned earlier that Senator Grassley uh, was chairman, it, then went into ranking member, now he's chairman again. Well. In the not-for-profit world, he has talked about executive compensation. He very quickly has revitalized that investigation that he did from about 10 years ago. We have seen that Deputy Secretary of HHS, um, Eric Hargan, has talked about how he is, uh, continues to look at uh, Stark and, law and the Stark law reform uh, and that he expects that to be on the horizon. Um, we have seen that CMS 
um, has talked about, um, as, as implemented, or actually not implemented, excuse me, we have the anti-kickback side on the pharmaceutical, but on the hospital side last year, they asked for comments. Um, and then on the 340B side, um, what is that going to do? We saw the lawsuit around that. Um, it came out in the hospital's favor. But the underlying theme that the, the court said was, this is not just an easy, let's give the money back, because this is a budget neutral um, provision. So any money that did not get applied um, to the 340B hospitals wound up becoming um, budget neutral. So it got spread around non-340B hospitals. So you're now taking away from certain hospitals to give back to other hospitals. That creates a turf war internally. So they're trying to determine how is it that they can read, uh, appropriate those funds um, based on the outcome of the lawsuit. Um, around surprise billing, um, this has really jumped to a top tier issue. Um, what we're starting to see is uh, the industry starting to do self-imposed oversight, coming up with criteria for themselves that they need to do. Some of the proposals that are being talked about are provider price caps tied to Medicare rates. Um, some people have argued that that's very uh, risky uh, to tie any type of Medicare payments and to price it to do a price cap um, for providers. And then also average bill charges could lead to price caps. And that might be skewed because of in-network, out-of-network, and the way certain providers handle certain issues. Uh, the next slide, again, is for a visual. It just gives an idea of really how hospitals, or excuse me, different physicians are charging based on Medicare rates versus their list prices. Um, and you can imagine the organizations that are farther to the right, they're the ones who are being the loudest around surprise billing in some of these proposals. Um, I mentioned the physician uh, self-referral law and Secretary Hargan talking about how he plans on modernizing this for physicians. Um, remember, this started really with laboratories and doctors having phys uh, ownership in laboratories uh, back in the late 80s. Um, so we're going to start to see, and one of the things he said is that um, he wants to see some regulatory reform that impeding coordination around providers that can provide better, lower-cost patient care. And that's really been the big mantra of the discussions around all of healthcare this year is really the individual patient. It's, uh, I would say 10 years ago, it was around the delivery of care. It has truly become about the out-of-pocket cost to the patient. Um, I will end with um, just a quick slide on cannabis. Um, Canada legalized last year, end of last year, and one of the issues there is something that um, there's really only two countries that have legalized, is Uruguay and, and Canada. And Granted, a lot of states in, in the United States have gone to either medical or recreational, um, but I would say when we continue to look at Colorado as the state, the model state, and when you think of Canada to the world of how they're handling legalization, what does it mean, what kind of revenue are they creating as a country, we're kind of looking at, it's kind of like Canada to the rest, of, or Colorado to the rest of the states. A lot of the states are turning to Colorado, the rest of the world is going to turn to Canada to see how that's going. As part of the agriculture bill that it, uh, passed at the end of last year, um, they started, they actually legalized hemp um, for uh, distribution, growing. What is that going to do to legalization? It's unclear. The FDA has talked about um, coming out with some regulation um, or stronger regulation around how that's going to be handled by the, in coordination with the DEA. Um, this is not something that the DEA necessarily wants. Uh, because they see this as being a pathway to legalization of marijuana and possible descheduling. And then CBD um, has come, uh, you know, whether it's an ingredient in food, whether it's a pain medication, we don't know what the FDA is going to do. We do know that next month they are hoping to have a meeting to get uh, community feedback around those two areas, uh, primarily around food so they can figure out what their jurisdiction needs to be and how they need to handle that. Um, with that, at the end, I'm happy to take any questions. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ed Alara. Thank you, Mike. Who are the dramatis personae involving FDA and HHS? Because I think it's useful. We're, about, we're less than 1,000 days into the Trump administration, and 
Tom Price, who was a physician from Georgia, has been replaced by a pharma executive from Illinois, or uh, Indiana. Scott Gottlieb was the most beloved commissioner in a lifetime. He left, or is leaving, and he's been replaced by Ned Sharpless. Seema Varma from Indiana has been ahead of CMS for the last, since the beginning. And Mike Pence is from Indiana, and he played a big role initially, I think, but his role has just quietly faded into the background, which, of course, maybe he likes best. But we're starting to see a lot of activity on the Medicaid side, and we saw an enormous amount of activity by Dr. Gottlieb, and it was all perceived positive. So, and I will just say that um, prior to uh, Scott Gottlieb's announcement, there were a lot of rumors in D.C. around Seema Verma uh, talking about leaving, who her replacement would be, and I would anticipate Gottlieb, because of his announcement, Secretary Azar told her, you're not going anywhere <laughs> if you're going to remain a friend of this administration. So what have we seen behind the scenes? There's been a balance of power fight, very discreetly between HHS and FDA. The average age of the people at HHS and the some of the administrative levels is much younger and less experienced, and they're trying to exert enormous power over the FDA. FDA is much more experienced. Dr. Gottlieb had a lot of experience before and after, and he was able to counterbalance the, impre the attempts by HHS to impose their ideas and policies on, H on FDA. So how that will play out, we don't know. So what I thought I'd do is have a look at Scott Gottlieb at what made him so effective and compare him with his successor, Ned Sharpless. Dr. Gottlieb spent a lot of time preparing to be commissioner. He worked at FDA, worked at industry. While he was in the private sector, he was an agent provocateur, talked about a lot of changes, had history in the finance. He was worked for an investment bank, was really intricately involved in policy. Even while he was gone from FDA, he talked to people in the field offices. He talked to just people everywhere. So he, were, he really knew FDA. He also, perhaps, of equal importance to all, he was a cancer survivor, a patient. So he had a, a different look at how clinical trials process and drug development worked. Dr. Sharp was not an fda -er, started two drug companies. He's a conventional academic or pick for the commissioner's office. Dr. Gottlieb, I think, was clearly an outlier and well-loved. Dr. Sharpless fits more in the vein of, was in academia at North Carolina, went to NCI, almost in one sense is very similar to where Dan Andy Van Aschenbach came, academic and physician. On communications, Dr. Gottlieb was par excellence. He's a master of Twitter, was constant, peripatetic on giving speeches. We don't know much about Dr. Sharpless communication skills, areas of interest. Competition was a really big area for Dr. Gottlieb. When one stand, we've been talking about ACA repeal for a decade, and that's really just insurance. We haven't really gotten to healthcare costs and how we're gonna reduce costs for Medicare and Medicaid. The number one savings driver in healthcare for the last two decades or three decades has been generic drugs. And they continue to come on at an enormous rate. Dr. Gottlieb is extremely interested in increasing competition, not only on the generic side, but also on the new drug side. <coughs> Excuse me. He's a firm believer in more and more competition, driving down costs, and bringing products to the market as safe, rapidly as possible as long as they're safe and functional. Dr. Sharpless, we, do, we don't really know. The jury's out. Dr. Gottlieb was also very big into devices, IT, FDA, drug linkages. 
as a way to also reduce costs, the jury's out on Dr. Sharples. It's all new. Dr. Gottlieb started initiatives with offices of excellence. Number one was Office of Oncology. They want to reorganize and continue to do that. He set up an opiates task force, which is still a huge issue for FDA, CMS, and the entire public health sector of the United States. He also created inspectorates to really improve and facilitate the way FDA inspects companies in the United States, providing more sophisticated inspections so that an inspector isn't doing domestic um, food facilities one day and drug companies the next. The next thing and the most important, I think, in one sense is clinical trials evolution. He's very strong on new methods, new clinical trial innovations, how we come up with new models, seeding clinical trials. He's been huge on this, very big now on real world evidence, which was inculcated into the 21st century cures. How we do that, no one's sure, but it's, it's got legs. People are very interested in facilitating the drug side and delivery side of pharmaceuticals on real world evidence. Big data is big data. We're not, sh no one's sure what that means. Same as Medicare for all, big data is unclear. Artificial intelligence. He, Dr. Gottlieb was very interested in just driving and getting all these new technologies into FDA, how it plays out over the next rest of this administration or Dr. Sharpless's tenor, unclear. You know, the one thing I would add, Ed, is that any time, and the government is no different than any corporation or organization, when there is a change in the top leadership, there will be a uh, power struggle for attention as well as portfolio expansion. What we've seen traditionally is when the commissioner is gone, the field compliance people take a stronger view and try to take more actions. The, thing, the other thing about Dr. Gottlieb's incentives, many of them were generated by people in the industry. I'm sorry, people in the agency. So he spent a lot of time gathering information, gathering ideas that led to initiatives. So I think most of them will have some legs. With that, we, we appreciate everybody uh, taking the time, and we're happy to answer any questions. We turn it back over to um, Medmark. Thank you both. We do have a few questions for you from our listeners. Uh, first, with the political divide in Congress and the White House, is it realistic that any health care proposals actually move forward? I hope so, or I'm going to have a very dull next year and a half. Um, no, the answer there is, is very simple. I think when we're not going to see the big issues this year. Um, we're not going to see the major reforms. What we will see is the building blocks to those reforms will start to move. We will see some examination and possible tweaks to um, various issues, um, whether it's been telemedicine. We're going to see some movement around the surprise billing, I would anticipate. Um, and I think we're also going to see, uh, if you look at the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and look at their recommendations around Part D and how to lower drug pricing, I think we will start to see some uh, movement and consensus within the Senate that could wind up over in the House around um, drug pricing. And then that creates act. And I think we could also see some type of patent reform around um, exclusivity for pharmaceuticals. Uh, would you be able to speak a little bit about the outlook for medical devices versus pharmaceuticals? Sure. I would say that um, at least within Congress, I'll let Ed talk a little bit about um, the FDA side, but within Congress, there has not been a big examination of medical devices. It has been something that has gone under the radar um, outside of the medical device tax, um, there just has not been as much of a power struggle, and there's been a vacuum in, I think, their agenda moving forward. Um, I think if we're going to see um, anything, uh, what we're going to ultimately see on medical devices is something, um, whether the pathway 
is the same and what type of um, coverage can be had within Medicare. Um, but again, even within CMS, it is not something that they've been very vocal about. Um, how is it that we can use medical device and the innovation within medical devices? I think we will see some type of dollars that will be spent uh, around not necessarily demonstration, but around trying to capture medical device innovation and how it's helped um, with uh, patient delivery. I think FDA has been very flexible and innovative under doc Dr. Gottlieb in moving devices along. I think the question that we're going to face is in this new, as we move forward in this administration, is how are you going to pay for these? Because the reality is, you can have the greatest technology, but if you can't figure a way to get the government to pay for it, you're in trouble. And I think we've got some fabulous medical devices coming in, particularly medical devices now linked with drugs and other d drug delivery. How do you really get a return on that? I mean, we've represented a number of former government officials in this space, and they always tell us, everyone who came to see them always told them their technology was going to save the government money, and it never, you know, we know how that's turned out. But I think there's going to be a tremendous drive to use technology along with pharmaceuticals to reduce health care costs. How it works, we're not sure. But I think we're going to look, get a bigger overall look at what does it mean to reduce health care costs. And I think one of the things we're also going to experience is that there's not necessarily, and, and this will blur the lines, and I know the question isn't around this issue, but at what point does AI start to play into the medical device discussion? Yeah, because the, the technologies are going at such a, a phenomenal rate, it, it almost defies that's the, And that's the challenge with the approval process. Yes. The, the, because I would say medical technology is moving far more rapid than the approval process, the sales process, right. and the delivery process. So by the time it actually gets to the patient, yeah. you're on to 2.0, 3.0 of that device. Yeah, you have one is really engineering and IT almost, yeah. and the other is biological. And it's, they move at different paces. Okay. How do you see the new freshman members of Congress, such as Rep Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, changing the dynamic of the U.S. House? So um, within this Congress, I think we saw a lot more people who are identifying themselves as a progressive caucus, such as um, Representative uh, Cortez. I mean, you know, she's been nicknamed AOC in this town, um, thanks to her Twitter handle. Um, and they are being, the freshmen are being much more vocal than I've ever seen freshmen be because they're recognizing that due to social media um, and the progressive caucus agenda, such as Medicare for All, that they're building up a lot of their base. And there is less accountability of how verbal they are, um, what I would say is knowing their place within Congress, uh, and I'm doing air quotes on my side of the phone. Um, they're being less cautious. So they're being a lot more ambitious about what they say, which has gotten some freshman members in trouble and reprimanded already very publicly and rebuked. Um, but they don't seem to be apologetic about it because they're, they're playing to their base a lot more than they are to the rules, the traditional rules of the House. So I would say overall, I think we're going to start to see that Nancy Pelosi is going to recognize that she needs to keep them close in order for her to move an agenda that may not necessarily be the progressive caucus's agenda, but more the Democratic Party's agenda overall. We have time for just one more question. As healthcare reforms are discussed, do you envision a deep examination of provider payment systems, such as the physician fee schedule or accountable care organizations? I do. Um, I think that's going to be um, a part of those building blocks that I talked about. We're not going to see a large delivery system reform. Um, we're not going to, there's no great bright ideas out there of how we're going to throw out the Affordable Care Act and come up with something new. Um, you know, in my mind, insurers aren't going to go away. 
the pharmaceutical world's not going to go away. The hospitals aren't going to go away. Providers aren't going to go away. I mean, all these different buckets aren't going to go away. So the only way to try and drive down some of that cost and try and, in a, a lower level, change some of that delivery system is going to be around payment systems, whether that's to um, the hospital inpatient, outpatient perspective payment system, the fee schedule um, around incentive program, how is it that they're going to incentivize? Uh, I think we're going to see that was a lot of talk, and it started to move in this way, and then it dropped off a little bit. I think we're going to see a reexamination or uh, a reinterest, so to speak, within um, value-based care, um, value-based purchasing. We're going to see that not only within the hospital world, the physician world, but we've started to see it in the pharmaceutical world, right, where we've seen deals being cut between insurers and pharmaceutical companies that are saying, we're going to pay less until we see results, and as we see greater results, we will increase a payment to you. Um, around the um, ACOs, right, we, this was really meant for uh, the delivery system as a whole to come together, the providers, the caregivers, to come together and split a payment based on results. And I, I would say that's somewhat fallen flat. We've started to see that, that there were turf battles between those providers in geographic areas. Um, so I think that we're going to start to try and see some type of models that are going to um, either try and fine tune it or try and replace it. And exactly what those are to date are unclear, but I think absolutely we're going to see because they're going to believe that if we can lower some of their payments, that will also wind up back in the, in the patient's out-of-pocket costs. Thank you both very much. I know your presentation will be valuable to our audience. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.